Ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure to give you Mr. Marcus Rock. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I'm taking the floor today to represent the idol of the technical support team for East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. The topic of my presentation is the future of work and social protection. And I structured my presentation as follows. First, a we'll short introduction. Then I will speak about some basic principles for strengthening social protection for changing world growth. I will then turn to building a social protection floor using social protection systems uh, before turning to uh, the uh, renewed debate about universal basic incomes. I will also touch upon ensuring sustainable and equitable financing through general taxation and other financing sources. And I will then conclude Ladies and gentlemen, the world of work is undergoing major challenges. Digitalization and automation have facilitated the emergence of new forms of employment, such as work on digital platforms, and have led in some countries to an increase in on-call employment or other forms of temporary and part-time employment, as well as dependent self-employment and temporary agency work, often referred to as non-standard forms of employment. While such forms of employment may provide greater flexibility to enterprises, for workers they often translate into lower and volatile earnings and higher levels of income insecurity, inadequate and unregulated working conditions, and no or only limited social security entitlements. Changing work and employment relationships <coughs> alongside weakening labor market institutions have contributed to growing levels of inequality <coughs> and insecurity in many parts of the world and to weakening the implicit social contract in many societies. Growing precarization calls for greater attention to employment, wage and social protection policies to ensure that the fruits of economic growth are shared on a more equitable basis. And in this context, social protection and its potential to reduce and prevent poverty as well as to address inequality, remain as relevant as ever. Various policy options are being discussed on how social protection systems can adapt to the changing nature of work and to close social protection gaps. For example, for example, coverage of workers in non-standard employment may be improved by lowering thresholds <coughs> regarding minimum working hours, earnings or duration of employment allowing for more flexibility on contributions required to qualify and on interruptions in contributions and enhancing the portability of benefits between different social security schemes and employment statuses to ensure continued protection for those moving between jobs. In addition, there is a renewed debate about universal basic income, UBI, as a way of improving income security in the face of uncertain availability of jobs. And I will come back to UBI in more detail later. But before that, I would like to discuss some basic principles which are important for strengthening social protection for a changing world. Many observers agree that the way forward to universal social protection requires a combination of contributory and non contributory social protection mechanisms. Non contributory schemes are key to ensure a basic level of protection for everyone, in particular for those groups who do not have access to any or any social protection systems. However, contributory mechanisms will continue to play a vital role in providing adequate benefits as they tend to offer broader scope and higher levels of protection. Decoupling social protection from employment would imply giving greater role to private arrangements thereby exacerbating the gaps in social protection provisions, including gender gaps, and weakening the responsibility of employers towards their workers. Moreover, 
<coughs> every contributory form of social protection, including private insurance and savings mechanisms, is inevitably linked to an individual's ability to work and earn a certain level of regular income. Current challenges demand the development of equitable, inclusive, and sustainable social protection systems, including social protection flaws that allow for adequate redistribution and protection for all as a matter of right. Despite divergent opin opinions on the future of social protection, it is undeniable that the demand for social protection is likely to increase in a changing world of work and contributes to ensuring that economic gains are shared on a more equitable basis. Social protection policies are a key element of the implicit social contract of end of decent work in achieving universal health care, reducing and preventing poverty, as well as containing inequality as recognized and promoted in the sustainable development goals. The growing relevance of non-standard forms of employment and self-employment in today's labor markets adds to the importance of ensuring those engaged in such employment are adequately covered by social protection systems. The social protection <coughs> systems of the future will need to be based on a set of broad policy principles that can ensure universal and adequate coverage and sufficient adaptability to new requirements. The following broad principles can help to guide policymakers in strengthening social protection systems, including social protection flaws. First, universality of protection and accessibility. It means ensuring effective access for workers in all types of employment, adapted to their situation and needs. Adequacy, ensuring that social protection systems do not only effectively prevent poverty, but provide appropriate income replacement in an equitable and sustainable way. Transferability, ensuring that social protection systems positively support the labor market mobility and account for the structural transformation of the labor market and the economy. Transparency, ensuring that all actors are fully aware of their rights and responsibilities, that legal frameworks provide for clear and predictable entitlements, and that administrative procedures are as simple and clear as possible, fully <coughs> harnessing the potential of digital technology while protecting personal data and respecting privacy. Gender equality, ensuring that social protection systems are sensitive to the realities that women and men face in the labor market, employment and society, and that they promote gender equality. And last but not least, good governance, ensuring that social protection systems are financed in a sustainable and equitable way, as well as efficient management and administration. In recent years, countries have improved the social protection systems along with the concept of social protection flaws, embodied in the ILO Social Protection Flaws Recommendation No. 202 of 2012, which guarantees at least a basic level of social security for all, including basic income security and access to essential health care throughout the life cycle. The ILO strategy on the extension of social protection is based on the two-dimensional strategy adopted by the 100th session of the International Labour Conference in June 2011. This two-dimensional approach aims at the rapid implementation of national social protection flaws, at least as a, at a nationally defined minimum level, that is the horizontal dimension, and the progressive achievement of higher levels of protection, the vertical dimension, within comprehensive social security systems according to the Social Security Minimum Standards Convention number 102 of 1952. This two-track approach of extending social protection outlined in the recommendation 202 reflects the importance of effectively coordinating schemes that entail contributory and non-contributory mechanisms, enclosing coverage gaps, thereby guaranteeing a social protection flaw, and ensuring more adequate and comprehensive social protection. The approach also underlines the importance of combining <coughs> different mechanisms that are linked to employment or residence in an optimal way with equitable and sustainable financing for taxes and contributions.
as I've already mentioned, there's also a renewed debate about a universal basic income, UBI, as a way of improving income security in the face of uncertain availability of jobs. As argued by proponents, it would guarantee a minimum standard of living for everyone, irrespective of employment, age, and gender, and would give people the freedom and space to live the life they want. It's also argued that the UBI may contribute to alleviating poverty while reducing the administrative complexity and cost of existing social protection systems. Opponents of the UBI question the economic, political, and social feasibility of such a scheme and its capacity to reduce poverty and inequality, especially in developing countries, where the livelihoods of the majority of the population will continue to depend on work. Concerns have been expressed that the provision of a UBI would relieve employers of their current responsibility to provide decent wages and their obligation to respect minimum wages and, and collective bargaining rules. Concerns have also been expressed that uh, to divorce income security from employment in such a radical way would provide disincentives to work. That benefit levels may be insufficient to ensure a decent standard of living. Or that the high cost of a universal basic income would displace other priority areas of government spending, including on public services. Some basic income experiments have already started or are planned in advanced and developing uh, economies alike. Uh, the currently most advanced pilot in Finland has implemented a partial basic income for 2,000 selected job seekers. Other developments include small pilot programs in India, Kenya, and Uganda. So far, well, no country has initiated a fully fledged UBI as a main pillar of income support, which would be sufficient to guarantee a national social protection for. And it is also interesting to note that recent calculations by the OECD find that a basic income at the current social expenditure levels would be likely to fall below the poverty line of a single person, thus having a limited impact on poverty reduction. Questions about coverage, benefit adequacy, affordability, and financing modalities, as well as the benefits and services that are kept along with the UBI, need to be further explored so that basic income can fulfill its intended purposes. Nevertheless, this vibrant debate on UBI strikes a chord with many who are concerned about the increased economic and social insecurity, growing inequalities, and huge gaps in social protection coverage for the majority of the world's population. In fact, the resurgence of the UBI debate reaffirms the necessity and importance of providing every member of society with at least the minimum level of income security essential to the realization of human dignity. The positive effects attributed to UBI reflect some of the fundamental principles of social security, namely providing at least a basic level of income security for all in a way that protects and promotes human dignity and allows people the breathing space to engage in meaningful and decent work and to care for their families. These principles are also at the core of the social protection flow as defined by the ILO recommendation 202. It is uh, therefore not surprising that the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme uh, Poverty in Hungary, uh, Poverty and Human Rights, has noted that a UBI would not be at odds with the social protection flow concept. As I've mentioned earlier, national, nationally defined social protection flow guarantees at least a basic level of income security throughout the life cycle. Some governments may decide to realize the income security component or the social protection flow through UBI. Others may prefer to provide such guarantees through other means, such as other universal benefit schemes, social insurance schemes, social assistance schemes, public employment or employment support schemes. It should also be noted that recommendation 202 reaches 
beyond a basic level of income security, emphasizing effective access to healthcare and other social services, and highlighting the need to achieve higher levels of social protection in line with Convention 102 and other ILO social security standards. While UBI may contribute to closing coverage gaps, its financial, economic, and political feasibility poses important challenges. However, many governments have already implemented universal benefit schemes for certain subgroups of the population. For example, tax finance, universal old age pensions, child and family grants, which constitute a basic income for older persons and children. For example, in Nepal, Mauritius, in countries where such schemes are already implemented, they've been very effective in filling coverage gaps in social security systems and ensuring at least a basic level of income security as at a, man a manageable cost. Universal coverage can also be achieved through the combination of contributory and non-contributory schemes, or the combination of contributions and tax finance benefits. Strengthening tax finance components within a broader social protection system can contribute to closing coverage gaps and ensuring at least a basic level of protection. However, in order to fulfill um, people's social security needs, contributory schemes will continue to play a key role in ensuring wider scope and higher levels of protection to as many people as possible, as set out in the international labor standards. <coughs> a greater emphasis on tax financing or social protection systems will be necessary in the light of the high demands placed on the social protection system due to possible high levels of unemployment and population aging combined with possible erosion of the contribution base for social insurance. However, there is little agreement on how this can be achieved. Some observers are hopeful that additional resources for the financing of social protection systems could stem from taxing robots and other technologies or capital in general to help to share productivity gains more widely among the population. Others argue that the taxation of carbon emissions or other forms of environmental <coughs> friendly taxes could provide an additional source of revenue. What is less clear, however, is whether and how governments could enhance their capacity to tax the highly mobile owners of robots and capital so as to mobilize the necessary resources for social protection in the context of a globalized economy and tax competitions. Governments are already facing major challenges <coughs> regarding the taxation of corporations, especially those active in the digital economy. Other proposals for enlarging fiscal space include the reprioritization of public expenditures, broadening the tax base, increasing the taxation of wealth, increasing consumption taxes in a non-regressive way, such as taxes on tobacco, alcohol, and luxury goods, reducing fuel subsidies, curtailing illicit financial flows, and more favorable macroeconomic policies. While it is essential that more effective tax systems can ensure an adequate and sustainable funding base, for tax finance benefits, it is likely that social insurance contributions will continue to play an important role as a source of financing for social protection. Complementing public and <coughs> social, public social protection systems, private provisions may continue to play a certain role. Yet the experience with the privatization of pension schemes in the 1980s and 1990s, which did not deliver expected results in terms of reducing fiscal costs, expanding coverage, and increasing efficiency raises serious doubts about the expanded role for private provisions. Coming now to the conclusions. Ensuring universal social protection for the future of work requires closing coverage gaps and adapting related to the emergence of new forms of employment, such as work on digital platforms and responding to specific solutions 
uh, situations and needs of such workers so as to realize the human right to social security for all. Many countries have already implemented innovative policy solutions to address these challenges, but more can and should be done to ensure that social protection systems are free for purpose. In fact, existing social protection systems have shown a remarkable capacity to adapt to new challenges. Some policy innovations, both in developed and developing countries, can offer some lessons learned that can help to stimulate such adaptations. New technology, including digital platforms and mobile services, can be harnessed to facilitate access to different categories of workers and employers, including in rural areas, and enhancing protection for workers in all some forms of employment, including on digital platforms. Social protection, including both contributory and non-contributory schemes and programs, constitutes an important element of decent work as it contributes to preventing and reducing poverty and inequality, including gender inequality. However, a significant proportion of the world's population still are insufficiently covered by social protection systems, leaving the vulnerable to social risks throughout their lives, particularly with regard to income security and access to health care. This trend of growing precariousness on a large proportion of the world population, alongside concerns of increasing inequality and informality, as few debates about the future of social protection. While new changes in the years ahead are likely to affect the world of work in general and national social protection systems in particular, it is without doubt that work will remain important for people's livelihoods and personal well being. Recognizing the challenges faced by workers in non-standard forms of employment and the self-employed and attempting to access social protection, countries have undertaken various measures to extend social protection. The first set of policy measures include the adaptation of social protection systems, particularly by eliminating and lowering minimum thresholds regarding minimum earnings, working hours on the duration of the work, making systems more flexible with regard to interrupted contribution periods, enhancing the portability of entitlements and ensuring effective minimum benefit levels in order to improve coverage of non-standard and self-employed workers. The second set of policies aims at guaranteeing a basic uh, level of social protection for everyone by complementing contributory and non-contributory social protection elements so as to guarantee at least basic flaw of social protection. Although the proposals for universal basic income and individualized arrangements may partially address the possible disruption of jobs and changing world work, they also raise fundamental questions about the balance between personal freedoms and societal needs, the meaning of work in human lives, as well as the fair sharing of responsibilities between employers and workers concerning social security. Even so, it is clear that current social protection systems need to be strengthened and adapted to adequately address the challenges in the global world, based upon the principles of risk pooling, equity, and financing, and benefits, so that social protection continues to deliver as an instrument of social justice and cohesion. The principles that I have outlined before universality, protection, accessibility, adequacy, transparency, transferability, gender equality, and governance can guide the way for measures to adapt and strengthen social protection systems. Building comprehensive social protection systems is strong, nationally appropriate social protection flaws, is fundamental to promoting more equitable and sustainable social protection systems. In this regard, I do recommendation of the to underlies the potential of combining different mechanisms of social protection leading to either employment or residence with appropriate financing taxes and or contribution. Fundamental to any reform is effective social dialogue. Involving social partners, including voice and representation of those in non-standard forms of employment and in the form of government. And on that note, I would like to thank you for your attention.
Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to uh, PIDS for the opportunity to uh, speak here this afternoon. Uh, just a bit of uh, disclosure. Uh, this uh, presentation today, portions of this were uh, presented two weeks ago at the uh, Ayala UPSE Forum on uh, uh, on, with the same topic. Uh, preparing or catching up rather with the uh, fourth industrial revolution uh, I, 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 I will be discussing uh, the topic that you have there uh, on the screen it's essentially the same thing if you're wondering about the color it's the UAAP season <laughs> The fourth industrial revolution is a label used to describe the current wave of technological advancement characterized by the interconnection via digital networks of all processes of modern production and distribution. It differs from the previous industrial revolutions in terms of its, the rapidity of its spread and its potential for accelerating economic development in emerging economies along with the promise of raising productivity, lowering costs, expanding opportunities, and improving the quality of goods and services, digitalization is also transforming existing patterns of production, consumption, work organization, and human interaction at some risk. Others say great risk to employment, incomes, personal security, and inclusivity. Two labor market related <coughs> phenomena widely discussed in connection with the digitalization are the substitution of computer enabled processes for labor in some industries and the growth of various non-standard forms of employment in the so-called gig economy. As an article in the October 2017 issue of the New Yorker observed, once robots assisted human workers, now it's the other way around. At Brown University's Humans to Robots Laboratory, computer scientists are continually studying ways to create robots that can work with humans in performing complex tasks involving fine motor skills. Think of picking blueberries, as well as recognize and operate things on the shop floor or in the general environment. This has unsettled many observers including a number of economists who are concerned that increasing automation could emissarize people with low skill levels and worsen inequality. Yet digitalization is also celebrated for democratizing entrepreneurial opportunities. With the aid of online technology and apps, various services such as transport, food and package delivery, cleaning and shopping, accommodation, among others, can now be contracted for on demand. Work need not be performed within the usual employer-employee relationships, but rather in a string of one-off transactions or gigs. The flexibility in hours of work and the relative ease of entry are considered advantageous features for workers in search of new or additional earnings opportunities. However, such alternative work arrangements have also underscored the risks inherent in non-standard employment and the inability of existing policy frameworks to deal with them. By way of contributing to the ongoing conversation about fire, we look at the related literature, what the related literature has to say <clears throat> about the effect of technology on jobs and make a number of observations in light of current st the current structure of Philippine employment. We also examine the gig economy in the broader context of contingent employment <coughs> and discuss the implications on labor policy of heightened employment and income uncertainty. I'd like to think that the discussion here uh, is complementary to uh, what uh, earlier Dr. Sawada had presented uh, on uh, uh, technology and jobs. A fact often glossed over in many attempts to forecast the future of work in the age of automation is that automation can also create jobs. 
through various effects operating within a firm or industry as well as across industries. The magnitude of these effects will depend, of course, upon labor technology complementarities, labor supply elasticities, and income elasticity of demand obtaining at the time. The view that any given job which delivers a final output consists of several tasks provides a useful framework for analyzing the effect of new technologies on jobs. A relatively new approach in labor economics, this is more flexible than the standard production function which posits output as a function of labor and capital. An important feature of this alternative model is the distinction between skills and tasks, which in the standard model are considered one and the same. In the task-based approach, the fundamental unit of production is a task, and skills are used to perform tasks, which are then combined to generate output. Tasks can be performed by domestic labor, foreign labor through outsourcing or offshoring, or capital, or capital, depending on cost considerations and comparative advantage. From this perspective, it is easy to see that technology can alter the nature of work by changing the way specific tasks are performed. Not all tasks can be performed by machines, however. Computers or robots substitute for humans in performing specific tasks, not the entire job. The extent of substitution depends upon the degree to which the cognitive processing of information, which is essentially a human activity, can be codified or translated to a logical step-by-step -step procedure. Thus, this is what you see uh, in the first column. Thus, many of the earlier functions of bank tellers have been taken over by the ATM to the extent that certain routine tasks, such as those involved in dispensing cash to a depositor, could be programmed. But this did not stop employment growth in banking as demand for banking services grew and teller jobs shifted to relationship banking. Similarly, the computerization of certain librarian tasks, such as cataloging and inventory, has allowed librarians to devote, devote more time to reference services or assisting elderly faculty members who are unfamiliar with the new search technology. A more complex way of processing information, which you find in the uh, middle column, is through pattern recognition, which starts with gathering data until it is sufficient for the computer to identify regularities. This is what is behind the development of algorithms enabling facial and voice recognition, medical diagnosis, risk analysis, and other complex, complex tasks previously performed only by humans. Where computers are incapable of replacing humans is in tasks dealing with unforeseen situations or problems where rules-based solutions are not readily available, or designing a plan for disaster recovery are tasks that cannot be programmed, although computers can certainly complement human effort by making information available. Tasks where personal communication is essential in order to ensure that information is not only conveyed but understood the way it is intended <coughs> also cannot be routinized. Thus, teachers, sports coaches, film directors, and managers are relatively safe from automation. On this basis, tasks may be classified. This is, a, this is the chart that uh, Dr. Sawada earlier presented. Tasks may be classified as either manual or cognitive, and routine or non-routine. The tasks just described are non-routine and cognitive. That's quadrant, quadrant four, requiring a good deal of problem-solving skills, insight, resourcefulness, and persuasion. 
These are performed by workers in professional, technical, and managerial occupations who are highly educated, highly analytical, with good communication skills and a mastery of their field of expertise. On the other hand, non-routine tasks, quadrant three, require the ability to adapt to various situations and engage in personal interactions. These tasks are associated with jobs relating to personal services, such as food preparation and serving, janitorial and maintenance work, caregiving and security services. The nature of these tasks requires many of them to be performed personally or on-site, and their performance does not require very high skills. Finally, routine and cognitive and routine and manual tasks, quadrants one and two, respectively, which follow exact and straightforward, repetitive procedures often performed in a stable environment are subject to automation, the latter much more than the former. Factory assembly line work and clerical and administrative support work are prime examples. Computerization of routine job tasks leads to the simultaneous growth of high education, high paying jobs on the one hand and low education, low paying jobs on the other hand. As middle education, middle paying jobs are gradually taken over by computers or robots. This is a phenomenon called job polarization and is confirmed by a large body of U.S. and international evidence at the level of industries, localities, and national labor markets. As the chart on screen shows, this is from the U.S., over time, jobs tended to bunch up toward the opposite poles of the skill spectrum. And so you see a hollowing out of the middle-level skills. Job polarization, however, need not imply wage polarization. Information technology and computerization raise the productivity of workers performing non-routine cognitive tasks and through scale and price effects, their wages too. This is not the case with workers performing jobs that are intensive in non-routine and manual tasks, which seldom rely on information or data processing. The problem posed by polarization is not necessarily unemployment, but that many workers who are displaced may not immediately be able to qualify for the good jobs. In this sense, technology can worsen inequality. <clears throat> Turning to the Philippines, we ask, how is this process likely to play out? First, I think that a number of factors will tend to drag the process out for some time, given the current structure of the economy. The economy is still largely dualistic in character. Nearly a third is in agriculture, of employment is in agriculture. And even as the routine and manual nature of work here may open up the possibility of mechanization, as in fact it has historically, other problems could stall the process, such as the prevailing system of agrarian relations. But even in the so-called modern sector, comprised of manufacturing and services, adoption of labor-saving technology could be rendered less economically feasible by the smallness of firms, the de high degree of informality, and the high incidence of self-employment. The existing wage structure may either speed up or slow down the process, depending upon how sectoral wage levels compare with the costs of technology adoption. But even were it economically feasible, the requisite skills to complement the technology may be in short supply. Consider the current structure of employment. The table up there shows total employment broken down by occupation based on uh, the Philippine standard occupational classification. 
Now, understandably, the occupational groupings here are too highly aggregated. In fact, each one is an aggregation of various occupations performing a variety of tasks. As a first approximation, though, it gives an idea about how a labor-saving technological shock might impact jobs based on the task approach. Now, the Philippine Standard Occupational Classification adheres to the methodology of the International Standard Classification of Occupations. Uh, the numbers you see there, the skill levels, are from the International Standard uh, Classification of, uh, of Occupations. Level 1 requires primary education, level 2, secondary, level 3, post-secondary, and level 4, university or postgraduate. As the table shows, low-skill occupations, levels 1 and 2, already account for three-fourths of total employment. The high-skill occupations account for 5%, and the middle-skill occupations account for nearly 3%. In terms of our two-way classification uh, shown earlier, level four occupations are intensive in non-routine cognitive tasks, level one occupations in non-routine manual tasks, and levels two and three in routine manual or routine cognitive tasks. The latter two occupations, about 46%, are vulnerable to automation. Of course, they will not all be uh, displaced at the same time. This is going to be uh, a process. Over time, as the nature of tasks changes, the types of employable skills will change. While increasing, <coughs> with increasing task automation, level four occupations may be expected to become more productive and highly in demand, fetching higher wages. Level two and three skills could become redundant, and without further upskilling, those with these skill levels may be displaced and further add to the numbers in the level one occupations, exerting a downward pressure on wages for those skill types. New job openings will, of course, be created, as was uh, shown earlier during the morning plenary session, and, a, and an example would be uh, the BPOs. However, filling up those positions will depend upon the speed of the supply response, and therefore, in the worst case, inequality could worsen. A few remarks on the gig economy. The gig economy describes a labor market environment in which jobs are short-term in nature, workers are predominantly independent contractors, and no employer-employee relationship exists between the transacting parties. A recent newspaper article, I think it was just yesterday, citing a report on Filipino freelancers notes that the Philippines' gig economy is expected to grow in the coming years due to better internet-based tools and platforms that connect them to clients in various parts of the world. The freedom to work from any location, flexibility in hours of work, exclusive command over one's own output, and a higher income, no doubt, all contribute to the attraction of the gig economy, especially for the young and the tech savvy. Unfortunately, no estimate exists on the size of the gig economy in the Philippines. The quarterly labor force survey tracks workers who are employed on a short-term basis or who work for different employers. But these categories are inadequate for identifying those really independent workers who select jobs according to their interests and not because of need. How do we separate, for example, the freelancers from the temporary or casual workers? At any rate, the gig economy has called attention to the risks inherent in non-standard employment arrangements. In the US and Europe, 
it has triggered a reassessment of policies relating to employment rights, social protection, and pensions. It has challenged the current understanding of the terms employer and employee, a problem that did not arise when jobs were well-defined and long-term and workers' bargaining units under existing law were relatively clear and firmly in place. These issues are not new. They are essentially the same issues that are raised in connection with the employer's practice of hiring workers on a non-regular basis, contractuals, casuals, or temporary, whether hired directly or through an employment agency. As in the gig economy, these contractual arrangements are generally of a short-term nature and do not grant the worker the non-wage benefits usually included in regular employment contracts, as these contracts conflict with established notions of the employment relationship, which is widely interpreted as a regular job that is secure, they are resisted by organized labor. The extent of non-regular employment is shown in the table on screen. Short-term, seasonal, and casual employment, those are the figures uh, encircled in red. They constituted 27% of all employed in 2015. Outside of agriculture, it is particularly high in construction and wholesale and retail. The next table shows that non-regular employment is particularly high among the low-skilled occupations, level one and two. So this is very much unlike the notion of independent con contractors who constitute a substantial part of the gig economy in the US or in advanced economies. The next set of tables are based on establishment level data from the Labor Department on agency hired workers and non-regular workers in 2013 and 2014. The survey was conducted among establishments with 20 and more workers. Of the roughly 620,000 agency hired workers, 90% is split almost evenly between industry and services. And most of these agency hired, work, hired workers are in manufacturing, wholesale, re and retail trade, accommodation and food services, finance, education, and administrative and support services. The last table shows the types of services that firms contract out in terms of the task classification discussed earlier. Some of these services involve non-routine manual tasks such as security services, food service and catering, and marketing sales. But some of the others are routine manual in nature and therefore vulnerable to automation such as production assembly, packaging, and warehousing. That these workers are still being employed to perform these tasks given the possibility of automation must suggest that the cost of hiring them under existing arrangements is still lower. I think that is an important research question. To conclude, in the current context of globalization, and technological change, and the ensuing process of job destruction and creation, the risk facing both firms and workers has increased. Survival in the global business environment requires greater agility. Thus, firms avoid being locked into production technologies that tie them to inflexible long-term contracts with their workers, increase hiring costs and make employment or hiring more difficult. To avoid these costs, firms resort to employment contracts that try to circumvent existing labor laws. And as a result, unemployment has become more precarious and workers' incomes increasingly vulnerable to, e to economic shocks. In response, organized labor has pressured government to impose limits on labor contracting thereby restricting employers' ability to terminate workers. At bottom, however, what this is trying to achieve 
is to secure for the worker the terms of employment typically associated with regular employment contracts. Continuous employment, access to wage and non-wage benefits mandated by law, and or collective bargaining agreements, severance payments. The government's response has been to define the scope for lawful labor contracting and explicitly assign the responsibility for providing mandated benefits or complying with labor standards to either the labor contractor or the firm for whom the services are performed. I think this is what the proposed law on security of tenure must be trying to do, defining the concepts employer and employee under a regime of production, under a new regime of production, in order to fit an existing legal framework. To repeat, in the current context of globalization, technological change, and increasing, and the ensuing process of job destruction and creation, the risk of the risk facing both firms and workers has increased. Firms are resorting to various cost-reducing technologies and alternative contractual arrangements that provide greater elbow room to stay competitive. Regulation should not curb, <laughs> curtail that flexibility, but fairness and equity require that labor not be made to bear all the risk. Strengthening social protection systems should indeed be an integral part of harnessing the fourth industrial revolution for broad-based growth and prosperity. The conversation about social protection should continue. No, yes, okay. Um, well, I, th I think most of what I was about to say has been said already. It, it's, it's an excellent session. I think uh, what we heard, the, the ILO position, which I, I would sum up as social protection as a human right, yeah, it's, it's, it's a perfectly respectable uh, social position. Then I think our colleagues' uh, very clear exposition of the numbers there for specific occupations is, it was, was, I thought, very impressive, really, really good. What, what I'll try to do is something slightly different. I'll, I'll try to, to get onto the drone of what was the last guy who spoke in the first, in the, first uh, in the morning. Get up in the drone and take it up a couple of miles up and start seeing the picture from a bit further up. Hmm? Yeah? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Get, get, get into that drone, take us all up and start seeing uh, the bigger picture and try to understand some of the principles because I, I think that we are going to be faced with a very with an enormous disruption, and uh, we we are we 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 are really struggling to understand what we faced with in many respects. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been an applied economist for decades, and uh, I've dealt with numbers, and and the numbers are very uh, they're changing very rapidly. The speed of what we faced with is 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 extremely it's extremely fast, really. I don't think we've seen anything like that before, and at the same time. The uncertainty that goes around, uh, that, that accompanies these numbers is huge. So if you can think of a forecast that's got really huge uncertainty, that's what we faced with. So perhaps our ability to understand the detailed numbers is not going to be the way to go about and, and decide which way we, what, what we should be doing in terms of policy. So my main question today is, uh, it boils down to, you know, what kind of policy routes uh, are, are we going to be taking? And I'll explain to you the reasons why I take this this uh, uh, this position. So first of all, I ought to say that this this project is is a collaborative project with the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council. It's sponsored by DFAT through my my visit here and Google and the University of, of Adelaide. And an outline that I'll, that I'll, I'll give you is about what I think is technological change. Uh, the fact that I'm going to focus on technology. 
Yes, I should be shifting. The fact that I'm going to focus on technology, work and jobs and the social consequences of change. And then I'll say a few things about the broader Asia uh, Pacific region. So, yeah, the first thing, it, take, take a historical perspective. You must have heard it some many times that we've been here before, we've got this T-shirt, we've seen industrial revolutions. So, you know, why, why should, we, should we be worrying so much? And the main reason is that what's happening now is incredibly fast. If you think about what happened in the first industrial revolution, it took about 30, 40, 50 years for the displaced workers to start coming back and finding new jobs. So the new jobs took a long time to reappear. So what's happening today is one industry goes, another one, uh, another one appears. So things are moving a lot faster. It's no, no surprise. No surprise. The technology in which this revolution is based is a lot faster. It's, it's, it lends itself to this kind of thing. So where do we see change? I mean, the main change we see, I think, is that now we can do more for less. That's, I mean, if, if when, when, when you strip it down to, 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 the, to the very basic, that's what we're faced with now. Information has become so cheap that we can do all these things that are based on information. That's what we've been talking about. We've, we have been talking about the price of information, okay? That's, that's, that, that's it. So the price of information has gone down so much that we can do all the kinds, all these kinds of things that information allows us to do with accuracy. We can do them a lot, a lot easier. At the same time, uh, we can, we we can we we have been liberalising trade, and we have been globalised. That's facilitated again by the fact that information is a lot cheaper. Uh, my my favourite example is this 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 thing here, which. I mean, you must have seen one of those. Yeah, it's the the added value of this uh, for the manufacturing of it is uh, six percent in China. The rest of it is U.S. and whatever else it's distributed, sold, and and, and supported. Uh, so what's been happening through this change is is an enormous unbundling of the production processes. So what we see now is we can do one thing here, the other thing somewhere else the other thing somewhere else, and we have these global value chains which are only possible because information is so cheap. <coughs> and to understand what this means is we have to think that information is not just only cheap, it's getting cheaper and it's getting a lot cheaper all the time. And we had about quantum computing today and uh, and I'm, I'm gonna, we, we're going to see a lot of change in work and jobs, which is what we talk about now. And we also are going to see a lot on the ethical dimension of, of our existence, of our human dimension. Things are going to change. I mean, what, what our colleague was talking about was something that we'll have to tackle in, 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 um, in, in great new depth. Because at the end of the day, what we're talking about is a possibility that we're going to live in a society where work is not going to be the core activity of humans. I don't think that anybody can envisage that very easily. So that's, that's roughly where I think uh, we are. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the types of technology, the net outcome. I'm going to say something about what is a bad technology and what's a good technology because there's a big distinction between these. And uh, yes, the ethical dimension is always in there. So, this I'd, I'd like us to think of technology as, as doing two things. One is it will either make humans uh, do things better. I think the computer-assisted design that the colleague presented earlier on is a very good example. We used to architects used to draw and engineers used to also draw, they used to make all these things, now you put them in a machine and it does it. And isn't it wonderful that you can do it so quickly and so, so efficiently. Now that doesn't dis displace humans, it simply makes humans more productive. So that's kind of a good, good thing to see happen there. Now there's also replacing technologies, and what replacing technologies do, they see the human and they go, and they send, they send the human away. And they're very difficult. My favorite one is, is a, I can't remember where I saw it, where I read it, that someone 
talking about the U.S. Uh, manufacturer, U.S. Rust Belt uh, sort of landscape, and they said that all you need today for manufacturing is, is a worker and a dog. And the dog is to keep humans away, and the worker is to feed the dog. And uh, that's it. And the rest of it is done by robots. So that's... Uh, well, it may sound funny a bit, but uh, it's, it's a reality in many instances. So, enabling technologies increase productivity, and that's the main thing that I'd like uh, to stay with us. And, uh, you know, they, they can, they can, the thing is that they can benefit both workers and uh, employers. So there's not, not that great a fight about, about the thing. So cost, the, you know, all, all costs and, and, and benefits are going to be sorted out a lot easier. With replacing technologies, however, uh, above all, what they do is they destroy jobs. And if you think about it, you have to, you, you, may, you may find yourself in the situation, you can imagine a situation where there is someone who owns a production process. Let's say uh, this gentleman is, is our boss and we're all his workers. And uh, suddenly he finds, and we cost, let's say, a million dollars a year. And he finds a technology which will cost him $950,000 a year and he is allowed to lay us off. Now, uh, he is answerable to his stake, to, 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 to his shareholders, so you know, he's doing what he almost legally, morally, ethically, whatever, in terms of the market uh, principles, what he ought to do. He lays all, all us off and he saves $50,000 and he says he has a dividend at the end of the day. That's a comparison we have to make all the time. And if displacement effects are higher, then you know that we see that, that wages will reduce. Otherwise, it's 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 a different play. That's a battle. So that's a main economic principle we've we faced with. It doesn't matter which sector we're at. It doesn't matter. All, all other things don't matter, and this is the main principle that we've got to be looking at. That's what we've been looking at all, all day today. Uh, now, this one, here, sorry. So, historically, the net effects have been positive. If you go back to the previous industrial revolutions, it's, it's, it's very loud next door, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it, it has been. What history tells us is that it's going to work out well. It's, it's okay. And however, more, more recent evidence tells us that stagnant wages have started appearing. If you look at the wage distribution, the development of the wage distribution in the United States, you, you saw that with technology increasing, we had the higher level of skills getting increased, increased wages, whilst now this has stopped. The wage distribution has started remaining flat. So things are not happening as they did happen in the old uh, model that we have got, we have seen through history. So perhaps we are going into our uncharted waters in terms of uh, the impacts, economic impacts. So, uh, what's a, what are the really bad technologies? They are the ones who just destroy jobs, and they they do that by bringing very modest productivity gains, so that's the one side of it, but also they're the ones that destroy jobs and then leave the displaced workers with no skills. That's now we're getting into the works, into the workers and jobs essence of this, of this problem. Uh, okay. So that's the that's one I spoke to, I'm sorry. I'm trying to coordinate this. So there's, there's, when we talk about displacement now, we have some, we, we have some serious problems. And the first thing that we have, and that's part of the literature today, is that displacement 
it's, it's, it's very difficult to measure. When, you, when, when a job is lost, then what, what's happening? When you, when you look at a job, I think you, you mentioned that, Emmanuel, that a job consists of several tasks. So you may have a job that consists of say, four tasks. Now, if you get some, if you get to see, <laughs> should I, should I, should I sir, shout a bit more? Like, <laughs> hello, can you keep it down? <laughs> right. Okay. Sorry about this, guys, but it is. Um, if you, if you think about it, you may, lose, you may lose jobs because of automation, but at the end of the day, it's these tasks that can be automated that are going to be lost. There may be a job that's got some parts of it that can be automated, but if the, the complete job cannot, sep cannot be separated in these tasks, then it's going to stay there until everything can be automated, or the largest part can be automated, or the bits that can be automated and these that can't be automated can be divided. So the measures that you see, uh, that you see out there, or all these estimates about how, you know, how, how, how many jobs are going to be lost, you've got to take a few pinches of salt when you see them. We don't know. The essence of it is we're forecasting and we don't really know what the problem, the, the size of the loss of the, of the job losses is going to be. Now, there's also <coughs> the question of how many new jobs are going to be created. And that's, you know, earlier on we were in the, in, in the difficult to forecast uh, area. Now here, this is, this is true crystal ball stuff. We don't know. I think anybody who says we can predict how many new jobs are going to be created by new technologies in the next 10, 20 years, I think they, you know, they, they really are making very, very wild guesstimates. So let's, that, that's, that's a thing that I think we ought to be starting with in order to try to understand where we should be going to from the point that we're in now. Where we are now, we've got to think about what we'll do with very, very imperfect information. And that's, that's, that's my problem about, about this. So if you're going to think about this, you've got to think about the surrounding circumstances that are going to determine your policy. So what matters here is, in a country, because if you think about the Asia-Pacific region, as, as I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes, it's a very diverse region. If you think of, of all the countries that are faced with, uh, with displacement, they're very different countries. They're very different economies. They had a very different economic development uh, level. And there was the, the interesting uh, 30 years, was it, that it takes for a robot to pay its, uh, to pay its price earlier on, which, yes, which was an average estimate and yeah, what, what's the point of having an average estimate of, of something which is so diverse? Obviously in some parts it's going to be two years, in other parts it may be 30 years, I don't know. But so the level of development is really important. Uh, the trade and investment relations. Now if you think about it, what, what does trade and, and, and foreign direct investment do? They, they actually, it's a mobility of goods and capital. It's it's the mobility of technology is part of it. So how much are these going to be feasible? How much are these going to be facilitated? And how much are these going to be uh, liable to external shocks? As we see, they are very liable to external shocks nowadays. And the last bit here, the factor that we need to consider is education, training, and skills uh, development. You know, the levels of these are really important from, for where we are and where we want to be in the, in the next 10, 20 years as the technology changes is, is taking hold. Um, yeah, okay, let's move on. So the big picture today, yeah, there are large rewards. I think if we fly up there for a few months and we start seeing what's down there, yeah, I think what, what we heard in the first two talks was so inspirational in terms of what can be done. You know, you look at the life sciences changes that are there, you look at the manufacturing changes. It's absolutely fascinating what, what can be done with technology like that. There's no doubt about it. The rewards are huge. We ought to be optimistic. But at the same time, there are some 
really important negative consequences. And uh, to cut to the chase, you go to the last line down here. It's political, it's economic, it's social, it's institutional tensions. They're all imagined. We see them, we live, we live through them nowadays. Okay? And as the technology takes more hold and as the change becomes more intense, these these problems are going to these tensions are going to intensify. I don't see how they could resolve themselves. There's no mechanism here to resolve them. If you think about it, I, I can't I don't see the policy mechanism to resolve these problems. So um, what are the potential remedies here? I've got a few things here. Education and upskilling, social protection, institutional reform, and again, looking at our ethics is quite important. And uh, there's been a lot said, I don't think I should be repeating uh, what was said uh, uh, earlier. So the principles are there. I think they're all uh, viable means through which we can try to address some of the problems that are going to be uh, introduced with our workforces. So I'll, I'll conclude, I'll take another, how much longer do I have? Uh, five minutes? Hmm? Okay, so I'll take, take another five minutes to talk about the Asia Pacific uh, region. So I think that's, that's where we are. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's got a lot of technological change. It's, it's been a region that's, that's been globalized and really interesting and uh, actually quite fascinating way because there's many, uh, there's, there's, there's a large number of uh, medium-sized uh, countries. There's, a, there's some, a couple of very big countries. There's more than a couple, actually, very big countries. So it's a very diverse region here. And it's very, it's, uh, it's very important uh, to, to see this. So what are the risks that are presenting themselves in this region nowadays? First of all, we're getting into a very tricky situation, a very tricky period of protectionism and trade wars. Uh, much of what we've been doing in this, and we've been trying to do more and more of, has been to trade freely, to develop the economies through, through trade and to try to benefit from these exchanges. Look at it in a different way. Uh, this is an external shock. Nobody can say that we were expecting certain people to be in certain places. But these, these are external shocks. And uh, you, the, all they will do is that they will come and influence all the economic factors that we are looking at in a specific way, which is going to be negative. It's going to make things a lot harder. Now, that I've, I've drawn this information from a recent survey that we've been conducting with the PCC, and uh, this, this, this is sort of a a, a very broad picture of what we, what we see there. There's a lot of a worry that China is going to slow down. That's, that's, that counts a lot in the, in, the, in, the, in the minds of people. There's also a great uh, worry that world trade is going to slow down. And also there's, there's uh, uh, the kind of the lack of political leadership in, in many instances is, is grinding uh, the the whole system to go slower than it could have been going. So what is <coughs> what is the composition of this of this area? We have a lower de de development part, which you know they would include countries like Indonesia. If you want to think of India as a country that influences what we do here. It would include India. I think the Philippines are in this part, and uh, and uh, there's the middle development part, which is uh, largely China, and there's the high development part, which is largely the U.S., Japan, and uh, Australia, Singapore, and and the like. And what what's interesting here is that the displacement that's projected. Okay, these are projections. These are guesstimates, and and they they really need a lot of. Uh, they, you need to have a bit of faith and always with a pinch of salt, please. But the projections that are there is, they make sense, that for the lower development, the size of losses is going to be particularly smaller. At around the 10% of the workforces are going to be impacted by 
uh, by technology. Once you start going to the higher development, where there's a lot more uh, technology, a lot more manufacturing in place and all that, the losses are calculated at around 20 percent. And once you start going up to the likes of the U.S., Japan, and in Australia, it's already happened. Uh, a displacement. No, it hasn't happened in Australia. No, no, no. In Australia, it it has gone a lot slower. But so we didn't develop that level of manufacturing as a proportion of our workforce. But in 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 the U.S. and other places, it, the expectation is that it's going to be massive displacement. Now that's and that's uh, quite important here. Now the sectors that are projected to be in decline. Uh, as, as, as you would expect, uh, manufacturing, wholesale, admin, clerical services, hiring vehicles, transport and sto storage. Uh, they, these are, this is no news. The growth sectors are, I see, as you would expect, science and technology, education, health, social work, arts and entertainment. Again, these are no, 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 no surprises. I'll tell you why I enumerate these things, because there's, there's, there's a very interesting lesson here. If you look at the occupations in shortage, that are predicted to be in shortage. It's, again, it's science, ICT, healthcare. And you look at the surplus occupations, and there's a whole host of occupations. I've got a big list here. And uh, yeah. And then and, and you 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 know it, it ranges from 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 uh, from laborers to to food preparation labor, clerical personal services, handicraft, plant machine operators, the whole, it's the whole thing, okay, time's up. And it, now, why I say the, why, why I enumerated this, these occupations is that, is because I just wanted to put forward the complexity of uh, how this workforce loss is going to happen. And uh, then, then what we see when we ask people about the skills in shortage, basically, what they come back, they don't come back to say that we want someone who's going to know how to operate this machine or know how to solve that or write this. Basically, they say they want people who can solve problems, they want people who can think critically, they want to have people who will be cognitively flexible, they will have judgment in making decisions and all these skills that are basically very transferable skills. They're the skills that you would want to have if you wanted to uh, future-proof your workforce. You, so let me go. So what, what we've seen, what I've said up to now, I, I want to come, I'm coming to the end is the size of the net displacement is 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 broad uh, in in the in the in the region and uh, that the combined impacts of the displacement at the micro level in terms of sectors occupations and skills and shortages is going to be very complex so what what this tells me is that with the policies we have which are just thinking we're going to provide more education. Just thinking what are we going to do when people will not have an income. When I think that the universal income policy is a very good social policy, it's not a very good economic policy. The economic policy is to find out how you're going to make new jobs, and not how to pay people who can't have any new jobs. I think that this, is, this should be separated. So. I think we're going to need further education. That's 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 to me that's a main that's a main conclusion of what of what of, of what I of what I understand here. And uh, when you ask people in the in the region whether they are happy or whether they have concerns about the level at which the institutional frameworks are ready for this kind of uh, for this kind of uh, revolution. It's an overwhelming, ma overwhelming majority that say no. Perhaps they, uh, it's less so for the education side, but when it comes down to labour and social care, uh, in most most people, most agents, most most stakeholders say we're not particularly comf comfortable with what we what we have ahead of us. 
So that's my conclusion here is that you know, we see that it's happening at speed and in depth. And I think that what we're doing, we're focusing now too much on, on its present wealth generation. That's a, the, the wonderful stuff that we saw earlier on. You know, the first two talks, which I, I think there can't be many people who weren't excited about the stuff we saw. When we saw all, the, all, these, all these possibilities, is, uh, they're amazing. But at the same time, I think we don't pay enough attention, which is what all three of us have been saying here. We don't pay enough attention to the fact that we're storing up problems in terms of huge inequality that we're generating that we don't know how to handle, and in terms of possibly very, very large displacement effects. So, to me, um, it's education that will do it. But education in itself is the old-fashioned education that I learned to deliver, which universities and schools have learned to deliver, is not really working on that. Well, because what it used to be, we were talking about this with Vic yesterday, what it used to be, it used to be qualifications that were translated into occupations. And even in the old days of this qualification, take any data and look at the translation of qualifications into occupations. There's very few of them that translate in, in any faithful way. So even in the old days, it was a bit of a leap of faith to get a qualification to find a job. Nowadays, the concept of an occupation is kind of gone. We, I mean, I believe that the statistics, the occupational statistics of 2018 are very, very uh, are hard to doubt because what used to be called occupation X uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, is not exactly the same now. It's, it's got different tasks in it. It does different things and all that. So the translation from education to occupation is not a faithful one. And even more so, the way we deliver now uh, our the tools that we want to give to young people to get to enter the labor market is not particularly uh, fit for what, uh, for what they're going to get in the future. We should be delivering more task, uh, more transferable task and, and uh, uh, education uh, rather than specific education, so everybody should be doing Fortran in their first, in in the in the in the last years of their school. I think programming. That's what I would say. Sorry, I've taken a bit too long. Thank. Uh, very important question. And it, um, it is something which occupies a lot of people, also within the ILO. Because what we are observing is, if you look at, um, let's say, uh, the share of wage, wages and of capital, you know, it is historically, especially in the recent past, very much skewed towards capital, you know. So the wage share is going down. And um, uh, why is it so? You, you mentioned, I mean, or you referred to the OECD report and saying that corporations, multinational corporations, um, I would say they have probably a, also a monopoly power in certain ways. You know, um, I have the wherewithal to come up with innovations, um, moving it fast, and uh, in no time, you know, have huge profits because there is nothing which contains them in any way in their profit-making uh, uh, aspirations. And uh, maybe there are also some barriers of entry for new companies who want to come and kind of copy what they are doing. So probably that we heard in the morning about competition laws, which need to be in instituted and enforced. Probably this is one of the aspects, but I'm not. Uh, it might be one of the elements which, let's say, explains this phenomenon, which we are seeing. That the share of wages is, is diminishing, but I think it's there are other uh, other uh, arguments which we can put forward to explain it. For example, I think there is less labor protection 
uh, in the wake of globalization going on more and more uh, outsourcing is taking place casualization of labor precarization of labor is taking place um, people are uncovered by social security or labor protection laws you know all that puts a lot of pressure on wages and uh, and salaries as well. Um, we can see that it has already uh, political ramifications. A lot of people are frustrated by the outcome of this globalization, uh, losing their job. Wages are stagnant in the US and elsewhere. Um, they don't take part in this uh, rise of GDP, which we see. They don't take their share in this. It's an unequal deal. Uh, distribution of income. Um, it's also probably that organized labor has uh, also weakened collective bargaining uh, mechanisms, have weakened uh, collective agreements, are not as strong as they used to be. Uh, and so organized labor, in the form of trade unions, cannot, you know, bargain the same way as they used to for wages and other labor protection, protection measures. Um, of course, as you mentioned, social protection as well, and I refer to it. So, um, is it inevitable and what can be done? I think uh, <laughs> it, I, it's not inevitable, you know. It, it, it calls for a regulatory framework which provides a uh, good distribution of, of, uh, of, of the fruits that the economic development produces. You know. The equal redistribution of, 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 uh, of the belts created. You know. A more equitable, at least a more equitable distribution between capital and wages and labor. You know. um, and we have international labor standards, you know, which uh, the international community agreed upon, that is international law. Countries are called upon to transform that into national law and to adhere to these standards and to provide even higher levels of standards, you know. And um, um, I think we, 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 uh, we see already a backlash on the political side, you know. People don't accept this anymore, you know, this kind of phenomenon they are seeing, you know. And they, there is a mistrust towards the political system, the so-called establishment. You know, so uh, probably uh, mm -hmm. political system, the policy makers, political parties, etc., have to respond to that in a certain way. You know, if they don't want to have um, well, uh, societal unrest, etc. You know, but uh, all this is, is a matter of great concern. Great concern, I think. Worldwide. Thank you, Marcos. Costas, you are going to answer the great question of the 21st century? And the answer is 36. For those who know Hitchhiker's is going to the Galaxy. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Listen, I, I think, I think what, what we have here is technology is, is a cause is has been making has been allowing capital to move where it wants to move if you think the process the, the production processes have have been totally unbundled in the sense that you can you can design something in one place be subject to the laws and the costs of that place then you can produce it somewhere else and you can produce it produce it with this enormous accuracy and total control which is automated and it's made possible by all these wonderful ways that we can communicate in and then you can transport it very cheaply to wherever you want to sell it and then you can provide support for that thing uh, from wherever you want to provide support so what happens here is, is, is capital is, is totally movable Technology uh, is is moving quite a lot. Large chunks of technology are moving. Uh, labor isn't as 
mobile labor is is kind of stuck where it is and uh, and what capital in the countries that grumble about it now uh, principally the USA what they complain about is that their capital has gone to where labor is very cheap and uh, and uh, of course what it does it provides them with much cheaper goods when they come back home so they've lost their what we're observing here perhaps is, is the fact that we're turning away from manufacturing into away from manufacturing and into services, which is not a bad thing. It's a form of specialization in a way. So I, I think <laughs> the bad part about this is the inequality that comes with it. That's 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 a thing that, that, that that's negative about it. And especially you find countries which were used to having very high levels of standard of living, now suddenly they have to, to do with much less and, and far, uh, far, far lower standards of living for, for parts of the population that were not used to this. And this is why, where you see the dissatisfaction that exists in, 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 uh, in many countries. But there are other countries that take advantage of it, where they take advantage not in a bad way. They, they, they can benefit from this, this unbundling. Uh, and, and these countries uh, should not be complaining, should actually be seen in a very optimistic way, like Mr. Ayala was talking this morning, in a very optimistic way. Look at the opportunities <coughs> that are generating for these countries in, uh, through, through this unbundling and, and the global uh, value chains. Uh, so, I think the picture is, is is far more nuanced than saying something is very bad, and uh, or, or something is very good. And the main principle I think that matters to under to be understanding these things is is actually the unbundling of the pro of the production process and the price of information. These two, that that's what makes it work. And perhaps. Uh, in, in some parts, I mean, you, you see with the migration crisis in Europe, it's very difficult to get into the European Union nowadays. In the old days, you know, Greeks could emigrate to Germany, they were welcomed, and, you know, hundreds of thousands of them. And, and now it's not, it's not easy at all. The same thing, it was easy to get into the United States, it's not easy at all now. Even Australians are becoming a little bit more uh, restrictive about about these things. So, migration is not the equivalent, the, the equilibrating tool anymore. Just very briefly, um, and to, well, mainly to complement uh, what's been discussed, I think globalization is an important uh, explanation there, along with technological change and the, the usual lag between these two forces and uh, labor market institutions to to adjust. Uh, uh, in fact, one outcome of that is, you know, the the, the closing of migration as a as a, as an equalizing uh, <coughs> as an equalizing factor. Uh, so with that. Uh, uh, option uh, closing as well as you know the the usual lag uh, of uh, institutions and policies uh, you have a you know a, a narrowing of economic opportunities uh, for a lot of people who uh, may want to work there, of course there's also the lag uh, 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 brought about by uh, the investment in skills. It takes a while before uh, the requisite skills can be developed to, to catch up. And if uh, the institutional uh, environment that allows for that is inadequate, then you have, uh, you, 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 you get these results. Thank you, gentlemen. So at this point, I wish to thank our distinguished uh, resource persons for their excellent presentations uh, and also our <coughs> the brave ones who chose this session.
We hope to see you again and uh, ponder the future of work. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mani. Thank you, Costas. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you, everybody. We are expected to be at the uh, market 10 yeah, for the closing uh, plenary session. Thank you very much.